Welcome. Terrific. Well, uh, first of all, thanks so much for, for having us here. And we're really proud to be uh, with you today as we roll out our uh, set of policies that we think uh, positions us mm -hmm. to uh, offer the most comprehensive look at uh, what the presidency can do uh, to empower women politically, uh, socially and economically. And uh, I'm mindful of the work that the Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence is doing here uh, and tied into a broader movement around the country uh, to confront domestic and sexual violence. I admire that work. Uh, it's uh, made a big difference and deserves allies of the, uh, uh, of the strongest character in the White House. So thanks for what you do. Uh, a basic principle of government, of politics, is that every American deserves to live in safety. And yet we know that uh, right now one in four women, one in nine men experience domestic violence in the course of their lifetime. And the numbers are much higher for women of color, for transgender Americans, uh, and for low-income women, who are often also the most vulnerable and the, uh, uh, feel that they uh, get the least support from uh, the community or from law enforcement when they need it most. And we have to change that. Uh, survivors stepping forward to share their stories, which uh, has often been an act of extraordinary courage, has also, I think, changed what's possible in this country. And uh, it ought to change what's possible in what we believe can be achieved in politics, uh, in, in policy, and in our space. And uh, I'm proud to stand behind and, and alongside uh, women who have really pioneered the changes that need to happen and offer a plan that, among many other things, addresses these issues. Uh, we know that, for example, we need access to safe housing. Uh, we need to make sure that our gun policy is set up to disarm domestic abusers. Uh, when uh, we have the so-called boyfriend loophole, for example, in, uh, in the ability to access guns and get around background checks right now. Um, we know that criminalizing non-consensual pornography or so-called revenge porn at the federal level can help us advance where we know that so much of abuse is moving into the digital space and needs to be confronted uh, as we move ahead there. We've got to act to reauthorize and uh, strongly enforce the Violence Against Women's uh, Act and make sure that the kind of political delays that we're experiencing can't happen again by ensuring an automatic timetable for reauthorization. Uh, we know that uh, we need to better train first responders, uh, law enforcement, members of the judiciary, so that their work is trauma-informed. We need not just trauma-informed medical care, but uh, frankly, uh, trauma-informed first response and a trauma-informed criminal justice system. Uh, and speaking of criminal justice, we know uh, from experience, certainly in our part of the country, why it is imperative with federal support to end the backlog of untested rape kits uh, that represents a, uh, an embarrassing and costly delay in uh, the need for, for justice in this country. But I think beneath all of it is the issue of culture. And that's why I am proposing that we ensure that everyone in schools, for example, is educated in things like bystander intervention. And we need to confront that uh, the problem of domestic and sexual violence, while so much of the leadership and work on dealing with it is uh, being led by women, uh, this is largely a problem of men and boys. Uh, and uh, the way and the, uh, that education works and the messages that are received uh, by young men and boys is as important uh, as anything that we can do on the back end, where hopefully uh, there is less and less occasion for the kind of work that you all do so well here uh, to go on because the, uh, the, the number of cases that reach that point uh, is reduced. So uh, I want to again applaud you on the work that's going on here and look forward to the conversation about uh, what's at stake and, and what we can do.